the regular meeting of the Southern Shores Town Council for May the 2nd, 2017 is now in session. Good evening to all of you. I'd ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd ask you to jump in a moment of silence, please. Council, I need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The agenda has been approved for tonight's meeting. Council, uh, before you, you have the consent agenda, tab one, minutes of March 21st, 2017 meeting, which are here on the table, and also the budget amendment number 18, interdepartmental budget transfer to cover some of the cost of Hurricane Matthew recovery. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Leo. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion to approve the budget amendment uh, and the minutes are, is approved. At this time, I'd like to recognize um, one of our police officers, Jeremy Hemmerwright, for 10 years of service. David? Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Just a little bit of history uh, for those in the audience and for you. Uh, Jeremy Hemeroy, he's a local, local boy, I guess is what we call him. <laughs> Born and raised in the area. He is uh, a Master Patrol Officer with the Southern Shores Police Department. He has a total of 15 years in law enforcement. The first five were with Manio. Uh, and then he has 10 with us with Southern Shores. He came to us uh, in April of 2007. Some of his accomplishments, he is a general instructor. He's also a specialized firearms instructor for our department. He's a rapid deployment instructor, a uh, simunitions instructor, force-on-force uh, -force training. He also uh, is an instructor for uh, concealed carry handgun permits for North Carolina. He is also one of uh, our department's uh, Glock armorers. He is also a CIT, which is a crisis intervention team. There's one of five in the uh, Dare County. Uh, our police department has three of the five, and Jeremy is one of those. He's also a field training officer, he has basic hostage and uh, crisis negotiation training. He's also uh, our department sniper. You can tell he likes to play with guns a lot. <laughs> He also has an advanced law enforcement certificate through the uh, North Carolina Justice Academy, and he also has a tactical certificate as well through the uh, North Carolina Justice Academy. Jeremy, congratulations, Thank 10 you. years. Thank you, David, for, uh, for your uh, list of his achievements. I asked David earlier to give me a cheat sheet so I could kind of read things off about his, what he's done for our town and our, our community, and he told me he'd take care of it. <laughs> I think he didn't trust me to remember all that stuff. Thank you, David. Staff reports, town planner. 
Good afternoon, Wes. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I have a brief report for you tonight for the uh, month of April. There were 12 zoning permits issued, 28 building permits issued. Those consisted of three new single family dwellings, two accessories, four remodels, two repairs, one repair remodel, one remodel addition, and 15 others. Uh, there are currently 19 single family dwellings under construction in the town, and the total amount of fees collected in April was $12,000. $996.28. Um, with respect to the May 15th or the next upcoming uh, planning board meeting, May 15th, uh, the board will continue to review and comment on module one of the uh, town code update project. Any questions? Any no, questions? No, I don't have any. Chris? Thank you, Wes. Thank you. David Cole, police chief. Good evening again, David. <laughs> Good evening once again. Southern Shores Police Department's uh, monthly report for April 2017. Uh, as you can see, we had uh, officers handled 753 calls for service. That's about 47 less than last year uh, at this same time. Uh, the breakdown of incidents, which are actually crimes that were reported, you can see that we had two breaking and entering, uh, one larceny, one assault, four fraud calls, we had four vandalism, we had one weapons, had two drug related, we had one driving while intoxicated, and then we had two others. Um, for criminal arrest, uh, we made two arrests on the breaking and enterings, uh, one for the uh, vandalism and one for the larceny. And uh, one for the DWI, we had a total of six arrests. Bless you. We also had uh, three motor vehicle accidents. Officers uh, stopped 89 vehicles out of that 89. They handed out 26 written citations and another 54 uh, warning citations. As far as local ordinances, uh, one for noise, two for failure to uh, display and 13 for failure to display uh, their parking tags or stickers. One in a no parking zone and uh, one in a parking in the right of way for a total of 16 altogether. Uh, any questions? Okay, what I'd also like to do is present the, uh, the town council and the town manager and the clerk uh, with the police department's annual report for 2016. Uh, for those in the audience, it'll be available on uh, the town's website and also the police department's website. Or you can stop by the police department and pick a, pick a copy of it up. If you have any questions or anything on it, my door is always open. Phone call. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. We'll Thank you. For Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Ed Limbacher, our fire chief. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, everybody. Hey. For the month of April, the fire department responded to a total of 30, 46 calls. Three of those were patient assist. 31 EMS assists, one vehicle accident with injuries, one power line, one arcing or shorted wire, one water problem, three public service, which are um, like the Boy Scout activity, uh, Southern Shores Realty, Big Fling, Spring Fling, they go and see the residents there. That's what that public service stuff is. And three smoke alarms, smoke detectors, for a total of 46. Anybody have any questions? That's uh, for those of you who want to know, it's 12 above last year, so last year was 34. <coughs> Thank you. All right. Anybody else have any questions? No. Thanks again, Ed. Thanks.
Manager's report. Peter, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I start out the report tonight reporting to you that the uh, proposed operating budget for next fiscal year, 2017-18, has been filed this afternoon. It is a proposed budget. It's uh, $5.8 million, as we um, have been over the last two budget planning sessions with the council. Um, it will be available for public inspection first thing in the morning, both via the town website, as well as hard copies available at the town hall for anyone who wants to request a hard copy or actually just come in and review it. And staff is always available to go over the uh, proposed budget with anybody that would like to uh, schedule a time and come in. We can go over it line by line with anybody or any group. Um, I did want to request of you tonight at the end of my report um, that you set a public hearing on that proposed budget for your June the 6th um, regular meeting. That's the Tuesday, June 6th at 5.30 p.m. And that will be the statutory required public uh, hearing for the, to hear from the public on the proposed budget. Um, the permitting for our beach nourishment project is almost complete. I've been hearing about, from the consultant or the engineering company about three times a week. The last agency to hear from is the, the final <coughs> final approval from the Corps of Engineers. Hopefully that'll be in place by this weekend and maybe going to next week, but we are close at this point. We've heard from all the reviewing agencies except for the Corps of Engineers, the final from the Corps of Engineers. Um, some bit of news on plan, our planning for manpower in the NC-12 Highway 158 intersection. Uh, the towns of Kitty Hawk, Southern Shores, Duck, and Dare County We'll be meeting very soon to plan out the times for weekend attendance at, in the intersection, just as we had last year. So that's good news, and hopefully we'll have it all scheduled out to where they can start um, the first major weekend of the summer, which should be Memorial Day, but um, we'll leave that up to the planning chiefs of the jurisdictions. But that's good news, and it'll be just as last year, uh, Saturday and Sunday as needed, two officers, et cetera. Um, the council approved project of pole lights uh, at the crosswalks on NC-12. The um, markings have, um, by the utility companies have been completed, and I'm advised today that we should be seeing activity tomorrow morning with the poles beginning to go in at each of the crosswalk locations. We've had a lot of citizen calls about the actual um, thermoplastic slash painting of actual crosswalks by the contractor, the paving contractor for DOT, and we've been in contact with DOT constantly about that. It is under contract, uh, DOT contract, so they do have a up to a certain date to put those in, the middle of May. Um, if you ride down NC-12 and the other jurisdictions, you'll notice that they're already starting to come down, and there's some in Kitty Hawk already, so I'm hopefully we'll be seeing those coming down soon in uh, Southern Shores. The stormwater remediation project at NC-12 in East Dogwood is well underway. Um, what you see there activity-wise now is the contractor um, had to lower the Dare County water line uh, that runs um, south to north on the east side of the road so that they could get the gravity-fed um, drainage pipe from west to east on top of it. When they excavated, they found out that it was not um, an eight inch line like the county had said, it was a six inch line. So they had to fill it all back in, wait three days for the correct parts to come and then excavate it again. And that's what you see going on out there now. Um, also today I was informed that a lot of different abandoned utilities have been discovered in this second excavation um, that they're trying to identify to see which ones are hot and which ones are not. So um, that's going on today. It may cause another day's delay to, to take care of those. The um, Wild Swan and Osprey Lane um, rebuild projects are underway. The base has been placed down on each of those two rebuild projects. Uh, the uh, concrete pouring, uh, concrete forming for the driveway cuts is underway today and hopefully that paving will occur within the next week. It'll all be paid, both projects will be paved at the same time according to the contractor. Um, the design for the five foot walkway that the council uh, directed is underway um, 
on South Dogwood and East Dogwood and just to clarify the council directed a design only to see what it would look like. Uh, we've had several meetings with the engineers on that and there are several different sections that they're looking at starting with on the design. The um, survey was broken up, I believe, into six different components that could be considered six different phases, um, but that's well underway. The engineers are working on that now. Lifeguards and Southern Shores will begin uh, their operations May 15th. Um, ATVs will start then and the hard stands will start up um, the end of the month. We're going to start out again with two hard stands like we have in the last several years and then put two more up as the uh, schools get out the middle of June. One final thing I did want to bring to your attention and the public's attention, the new speed limit on NC-12 goes into effect around May 15th. Um, DOT is committed to changing out the speed limit signs on that owner before that date. And also, they'll, that'll, they'll have them in place through September 15th. So we continue with um, advertising that in the newspaper and on different um, media format to try to keep the public informed that that speed limit will go from 45 to 35 in that section um, for the summer. And I'll answer any questions if, if I can. I just want to remind you, too, we need to have some sort of action to set June 6th as a public hearing date for the proposed budget. I understand. Any questions for Peter? No, I don't have any. I, I have a question that's been asked Sorry. of me. I, so I thought I'd better ask you that the, uh, the selection of where the 35 mile an hour speed limit would go from the new 35 mile an hour speed limit would, would stop. It, is it Trout Run, just south of? of uh, Trout Run. And there was a, what, was the, what was the rationale for, for that? Because I've been asked that question and I couldn't answer it. Why that was, why that was the, the like point where, where back Most to of the cross, and I'll let the chief chime in if you want to, but most of the crosswalks were on the southern end. Right. Um, that was the main reason. No, I know it wasn't our decision, chief. I knew that. And, and that, that's good. That makes sense. I, I, I kind of thought that was the case too, because of the many crossovers between between uh, the inter between the triangle and, and and town hall. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, Council, I need a motion, as I understand it, to um, set a public hearing for January the sixth, June the sixth of this year, to dis to um, present the. 2017-2018 budget. So moved. Is it, do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Peter, is that, is that going to be all right with you? That's correct. All yes, right. sir. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Motion's made and carried. Do set a public hearing for June the 6th for the discussion of the budget. Town Attorney's report, uh, Mr. Gallup. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the first thing I wanted to report, uh, isn't on the agenda, but the uh, Emerald Isle case that I worked on last year that went to the Supreme Court about whether, or the North Carolina Supreme Court, about whether or not the public has the right to use the ocean beaches in North Carolina seaward of the dune line. Uh, the owners of the property, or the used to be owners of the property, no longer owners of the property in Emerald Isle, the knees, their attorney has filed a petition uh, for a writ of cert, which is essentially requesting the ability to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, so the process continues. Um, Emerald Isle will have an opportunity to respond to that. If the Supreme Court accepts it, then there will be briefing and oral arguments. Um, if the pre Supreme Court denies it, then that will be as final a resolution as will ever be of the case. Um, there are uh, possibilities, again, for amicus parties to uh, be involved, both at the petition stage, uh, requesting the appeal and opposing that, and then also if the appeal is accepted, 
um, to oppose it um, on the merits on the briefs at that time. Um, I sent out an email to all the parties who were involved last time, and uh, I, we'll see where it goes, but I'll keep you up to date on where it stands. And then the next thing that's on here, that is on here, is the one that I'm not as much prepared for. Unfortunately, I had a medical appointment this afternoon that got in the way of me fully preparing for this. But um, it was discovered last year, if you recall, the council adopted a 6,000 square foot maximum limit on structure size. And in looking at that, determining how to calculate that 6,000 square feet, uh, Mr. Haskett was looking more closely at the wording of living space and its association in the, uh, in the town code. In most zoning districts, all the residential zoning districts, there is a prohibition of living space being in accessory structures. That had been interpreted by multiple different zoning and building, administra building zoning administrators and building inspectors who were doing zoning work over the past 10 or 15 years at different times, probably different ways, but some of them were looking at it as a living space being a dwelling unit, something someone could live in that would have a cook stove and, and bathroom facilities, essentially a, a grandmother suite is what people would call it. And that's how it had been treated, but once looking at the 6,000 square foot language, it was recognized that uh, a dwelling unit was defined differently. and that the uh, habitable floors definition associated itself with living uh, space. And habitable floors essentially were anywhere that someone could uh, live. And it didn't require the extended, uh, the ability to live separately such as a dwelling unit would require with cooking facilities and bathing facilities. So uh, when Mr. Haskett noticed that, he asked me about it, and I told him that I believe that the uh, ban on living space above accessory structures essentially applied to all heated square footage above or within an accessory structure. Looking further at that, there, uh, it came to our attention and was pretty clear that there had been some cases in the past 10 or 15 years and before that even before this ordinance was passed where um, accessory structures did include what living space would encompass even if they didn't go all the way to the dwelling unit factor. So um, what we're proposing is to take a two-step process to address this. The first would be to adopt uh, an amendment to the zoning ordinance and to the flood ordinance that says that those that were permitted, duly permitted, and otherwise lawful at the time that they were constructed remain lawful and remain legally non-conforming, which means that they can continue as they are, but they can't be expanded and they can't be changed significantly. I, I wish I could explain expansion a little bit better, but it's a, a lot easier to determine when somebody's asking if they can do it than it is to explain all the different uh, methodologies that that could uh, apply to. And then the second step, would be what do you want to do with the future if the council ultimately decides that uh, they want to continue the prohibition then the first step is really all that's probably necessary um, but uh, if the council decides that their uh, the council has some ability to decide to allow some of these type of things above above houses and it could go all the way to having allowing dwelling units it could have a limitation on how much square footage you could have and make it not a dwelling unit. And then there's a consideration of does it track to the 6,000 square feet or is it a separate measurement? And uh, so what we're proposing at this point is to um, present the planning board with a prepared amendment regarding the nonconformity issue and have that go through the process of the planning board's process and come to you for consideration in that process. And then to also prepare for the planning board uh, two or three different options about how to consider accessory structures and let them uh, act as a filter and, and give you some recommendations on that. The first one 
when it would come to you, I would expect to go ahead and have a public hearing and to go ahead and consider it and, and take action. And the second may be something that goes back and forth to some degree. But putting the first in place gives you the ability to um, study the other options more thoroughly over time and to keep the status quo as it is. So that's what that line item is about. And I, I don't really need anything tonight. Uh, I think we've already got our direction from when we brought this up to you in closed session previously. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we'll go forward and have those go to the planning board and they'll come to you at a public hearing stage. You don't have to direct anything going to the planning board this time? No. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Any questions? Chris? No, no I, I'm just, um, I'm a, I'm, encouraged to, to hear we're dealing with these existing structures oh, yeah, that are non-conforming that have been there. Um, I agree with the methodology that I'm hearing, which is we've got some that are clearly not conforming now, and then we've got to figure out what to do in the future. Um, and I, so initially, I, I like separating that out yeah. to, to determine to make the best decision. Um, and then, uh, and actually, I'm not discouraged that, that, that you're not ready to talk about it. It'd be good to have the other folks here when we do that and get get their thoughts too so that's all i have mr Mayor. thank you ben appreciate that board reports planning board good evening again wes <laughs> One of chairperson williams couldn't attend tonight so i just have a brief report for the planning board uh, they did meet last night and there was a special meeting, and it was to uh, continue discussion of the town code update project. And I have a feeling there are going to be uh, months of meetings to get through their review. Um, the board will be holding uh, special meetings on the first Monday of each month uh, for that purpose of so specifically reviewing uh, town code update module one. Then, of course, their regular meeting date is always on the third Monday of the month, unless there's a holiday. Same for the first of the month, but um, and they'll review. They'll uh, continued discussion of town code update module one as well then as well as con considered applications as they come in um, so the next meeting will be uh, May 15th and uh, they will continue discussion there are no other applications for that meeting um, and at last night's meeting uh, they did get through uh, chapter one general provisions chapter four definitions and chapter 20 buildings and building regulations so that's where they are now um, the discussion on the zoning chapter will begin at the May 15th meeting, and um, I think that will take the most time out of the remaining chapters. Module 1 consists mostly of land use <coughs> chapters. So uh, hopefully we'll move along in a somewhat timely manner, and uh, the board will have a recommendation for you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. At this time I'll open general public comment. Mr. Vince Ferretti, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here, um, I live at 296 Wax Myrtle. I've owned a house here since 1984. I've been coming here since 66, and I've lived here since 2000, actually physically lived here. Um, I, um, I talked to Wes about uh, building an, an addition to my house and whether it should be separate or connected. Um, I've transferred about 80% of my house to my son, who's going to retire in five years, and my wife has now died, and she thought it was a great idea that we stay there if we could. Well, uh, so I want, to, want you to know I'm coming from that aspect. Uh, I've got some interest in this area. It's cheaper to build a separate building. Uh, we wanted a two-car garage and then some habitable space above it. Um, I noticed that there have been many accessory buildings with habitable space, but not a stove. Um, so they, didn't, they weren't separate housekeeping. Built with permits from Southern Shores. And uh, I think we need to do something about them, as, as the attorney said, we maybe grandfather them. I think we should talk about permitted structures and otherwise lawful. Got to be careful of lawful, because they probably were not lawful at the time, even though they were permitted because they're not, they weren't in the code, so you have to be careful of the wording. You don't want to really put these people down under who have relied on you. Um, 
I believe we shouldn't permit a homeowner to rent habitable space to a non-family member, even if they do have accessory buildings. When I was the Assistant City Attorney of Rockville, we created what we called a grandfather uh, suite. In, in cases where a, a child was moving into a, a home and uh, the elderly parent was there and wanted to have a sense of independence, a feeling of independence. And so we did that uh, in part of the zoning code. And um, I think this town should explore that, given the aging population of our town. I think that we can craft an ordinance that will help our elder citizens and not open the floodgates to two families living on the same lot. Um, I thank you for the time. I, uh, I, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about that's been talked about here, and that's crossover, the pedestrian crossovers from the beach crossovers. There's one at 108A, Ocean Boulevard. Never was designated, there was no street uh, markings there. But uh, the reason you have those crossovers is to make it safe for a person to cross who's coming from the beach to the west side. People cross there because there is a crossover there. And if you're going to protect one person at these other crossovers, you should protect that person too. It's not about the number of people that cross. It's about each individual citizen. And you might have a problem, a liability problem, if you're going to, um, in the nature of, a, of an attractive nuisance, if you put a crossover there, and then you don't try to protect the crossover. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to, want to be thinking about that. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Carlos Gomez. Good evening, Carlos. Um, hi there, Tom, Chris, Leo, everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk to, um, to start. I, I'm Carlos Gomez. I live in 46 Juniper Trail for almost <coughs> about 25 years. I'm the owner and president of Coastal Engineering Surveying, a civil structural design and planning uh, firm where I serve as a professional engineer, land surveyor, and I have the honor of serve as an alternate planning board member. I'm here today to talk about what I consider a sad situation that is going through the whole town for the time being, and I'm getting note of that. What I see is the fact that there doesn't seem to be a com common unity in our community with respect to some issues. Um, it was less than a month ago that uh, the neighbors along Juniper Trail were summoned to review what's going on on Juniper Trail. Um, it's hard to put three minutes into all the things I want to say. Um, the job consists pretty much of resurfacing Juniper Trail from the bridge to uh, Sweet Gum, uh, the replacement of the sidewalk and raising it up uh, to, since it's wor a lot of places working as a stormwater detention mm -hmm. pond. I had to drop inlets uh, across the, under the road, a stormwater pond. And it's just changing the look of, the, of, of what we had there for, for a very long time. Before the sidewalk improvements along Juniper Trail, there were no problems with stormwater. But then we put the sidewalk in there, and now the water doesn't have anywhere to go, and it ponds on the street. And now we have a new stormwater pond problem that makes it really worse when a car, you know, walking the dog, walking around, and then just a car goes by and we get washed. Well, we know we have to fix that problem, but uh, doing all this, uh, it's, the complaints have started, and then we have to do all of this. Uh, it comes out that we, we cut in eight Beautiful trees, but actually three that were very superior. Uh, there may be concerns about it. One was about 70 feet wide oak tree, and we're going to put curve and gutter on the side. My professional opinion as an engineer, um, I, I don't think the resurfacing is necessary just to raise the sidewalk. There, there, there's innovative systems that can be done to fix that problem. We are having to cross Juniper, create a stormwater pond, on and on, and, and cut all these trees. Um, also, do not believe the need of the curve and gutter to, to, it's just modernizing our town, our looks. Yeah. All this is dependent on uh, street ordinance. ordinance. Gentlemen, I believe our problem lays 
on a street ordinance, which is in direct contradiction of the intent of the founders of the town. Um, very, very quickly. Uh, Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. All right. Can I finish in just 10 seconds? Well, well I'll, call, I'll follow can, can later. I'm sorry? Let me finish. Sure. <laughs> well, I was a designer for, uh, for uh, Kitty Hogland Company for Mickey Hayes, the, fo the form founded by David Stick. Uh, it's the vision of the town was to have a low impact and density development. Southern Shores and, and, and Pebble Beach, California have a lot in common. I study that subdivision. They have a street that is 17 feet long, uh, 17 miles long. And they charge a toll for people to endure the pleasure of going up along these streets. And they use curves to protect the trees. And um, we have that in common. So let's not modernize the views and looks of our town without proper, careful landscape design. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark Martin. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I'm Mark Martin. I reside at 191 Wax Mortal Trail, Southern Shores. Uh, my wife and I own San Mark Custom Homes and have been here for 20 years now. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the accessory structures um, uh, from my perspective of it. About, and to give you an idea where some of the confusion happens over the years, <clears throat> um, probably eight years ago, at a client or neighbor call out and say, hey, I want to build a pool house with a little heated area so the kids can get in off the pool, attached by a deck. Can you build it for me? I said, I don't think so because uh, the town, I think those are outlawed in the town. But I've got to do some checking. So went, came up to the town, checked with the administrator, which nobody was here at the time. Um, <laughs> I'll, let me preface that. Um, and nope, can't do it. Got to be attached by heated, heated living space. So three weeks later, building permit sign goes in, pilings go in. Project that I looked at that couldn't be done is being built. So I came back to the town. Oh, no, we must have misunderstood you. Yeah, it can be built. Said, well, you can't, couldn't, at that time, you couldn't find any of the documentation to go in, couldn't go online to pull this stuff up to see what we have. Thank you for going through and reviewing the modules, and hopefully at the end of that process, we all know what we can build and what we can't build. So over the years, see detached garages going up, attached by decks, thought that was the norm. Got an 8,000 square foot one here, a few more up the beach. So client calls other side of us. We well, want to build a garage. Can you come up and take a look at it? So went up, designed a garage, had a room over it, knew it had to be attached by a deck, didn't want to replace the septic, had no room to replace the septic. Uh, there's a big hill up there. So we basically design the house is here, septic is here, new structures here, attached by a deck. <coughs> Drawn, $2,500 underspent for plans. Um, I spent $500 for an engineer, um, $125 for the health permit, got the review board approval, took it to Wes, can't accept it. That's when all this stuff started happening in December. So he said, you can redesign it, and gave me some options there, took it back to the owner. Owner didn't want to redesign it because of the way it was going to impact our screen porch. So they basically put it on hold. So the crew I had ready to go on that job sat home for Christmas and New Year's. Didn't have any work because we didn't have another job online because this one was going to be permitted and ready to go. So there was a, four guys out sat home during holidays. Um, you know, the, at the time, I think the town attorney advised us we could go ahead and go to the Board of Adjustments, which, you know, there's another $2,500 out by the time you do an attorney to come and represent you. So it's a very difficult road and uh, one that I'm very interested in. And uh, I agree with Mr. Ferretti on a lot of the things he said about it. So it's Thank very you. complicated. We need to get it fixed as quick as we can. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Debbie Newberry. Good evening, Debbie. Thanks. 
Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, my husband, um, sorry he couldn't make it here tonight. He's, uh, it, it'll be a few more weeks before he's moving around too much, or, or very much, but he does apologize. He wanted to be here. Um, and sorry to see that Gary isn't here either. It's a, a shame when we don't have uh, a number of council members here for a meeting. But what I wanted to talk about a little bit today was just I wanted to talk about low-impact development again. Um, I see that we're doing this again over, I believe, in Chickahawk, um, where we're uh, working on the road, we're putting in curbs and gutters, and we are cutting down trees. And again, I thought at Southern Shores, we were supposed to be doing low-impact development, and in no way, shape, or form is curbs and gutters and cutting down trees considered low impact development. And I would really like the council and the town manager and such to start looking at this and let's really do uh, low impact development or maybe it's time to change our vision and we can say that, hey, we wanna be Northern Virginia, we want our wide streets, we want curbs and gutters, we want the trees gone. That's not what most of us moved here for. So please let's reconsider this and look at what we're doing in the large picture to our streets and what curbs and gutters do to the flooding situation that we have. They only make them worse and it costs a lot more and the upkeep is much, much more. Let's look at swells, let's look <coughs> at uh, different things like that and let's look at the natural topography to try to take care of our situation and please stop the curbs and gutters. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Jim Connors. Good evening, Jim. What I'm about to speak to obviously doesn't um, apply to tonight, but um, three days ago I attended a memorial service at All Saints for an extremely valued member of both that church and our town. At the conclusion of that service, I approached Southern Shores residents and just asking how he was and mentioned that I hadn't seen him at any town council meetings for a while. He said those meetings have gotten way too long and boring. I agreed and told him I've heard that sentiment from quite a few people in the town recently. Now, the town council needs sufficient time to conduct their business and nobody's trying to cut you all short up there, but I'd like to offer for your consideration um, the following suggestions. That one, town council, town council members show up prepared and ready to conduct business. This has not been a problem lately, but it was an impression by many in the public in years, in pre, you know, previous months. The second one is get the agenda squared away before you all start meeting. Um, you can waste a lot of time, or not waste, but you can spend a lot of time just discussing what to add to the agenda for that night's meeting. And third, probably the most important point I'd like to make is be very judicious when approving outside groups to make presentations or at, at, during meetings. Also, where they are placed on that agenda. When the League of Women Voters um, requests time for a presentation, they should be welcomed and given front and center exposure here because they usually speak to something that's relevant to all the citizens of our town. But when some attorney stands up here and speaks and advocates for three lane and NC-12 and installing roundabouts up, up the, at every intersection, that is actually advocating against what a lot of citizens have spent a lot of time and hard work on um, trying and trying to get the uh, Mid Curry Tug Bridge built. The fourth and final one that I'd like to um, suggest is I don't know how to do this, but somehow when groups get together and come up here and speak and say the same thing over and over, when you have five people saying the same thing, that takes up 15 minutes. And I, I don't know how to handle that, but it might be worth. Uh, folks in the town, the public, and trying to um, address that. The long end of what I'm saying is that the length of our council meetings recently is actually discouraging um, the you know, public participation. I'm about to blow this clock, but I would like to, in closing, say I'm not much of a praying man, but I'd like to ask everybody to remember Jennifer Frost. 
Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Tommy Carroll. Good evening, Tommy. Tommy Carroll, 77 East Dogwood Trail. Uh, low impact development has become a big issue, I guess, come to the forefront again, and I think it'll be a big issue in this year's campaign. And uh, my question is this. Uh, my statement is this, under no definition, under any elementary definition of low impact design, I meant development, low impact development, is there a place for curbs and gutters? There, that, that's the top of the list that we shouldn't be putting curb and gutters at. The standard answer when our town manager is asked why we're putting in curbs and gutters is that he's doing what he's told and directed by the mayor and the council. Understood. Now my question to you, Mr. Mayor, is why is he being directed to install curbs and gutters and go against what our adopted land use plan calls for? It calls for low impact development, curbs and gutters, aren't a part of low impact development, why is our town manager and therefore the engineers being directed to install curbs and gutters? I'd like you to answer that during your comment period. My second would be to Ben. Under an adopted plan by our town, is the council and the mayor legally bound in any way to follow that adopted plan. My point is this, low impact development calls for no curbs and gutters, and there's an obvious, in every project we do, we're adding curbs and gutters. So where's the miscommunication? Where is the, where is the legality? Where is the, how are they bound to follow something that came through camera and that was adopted by our town? Thank you. Thank you. Brian Forbes. Good evening, Brian. <coughs> I'm Brian Forbes, uh, 10 Pelican Watch Way across the way there. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you and uh, the town council, uh, the town attorney, uh, the uh, town manager, and the town staff for all the work and efforts that you've uh, put in to uh, make the beach nourishment uh, project uh, a reality. Uh, there's a lot of people that really appreciate uh, all that you all have done. And I know it's been a long, hard, contentious uh, process, but uh, we really appreciate uh, all your efforts. And I just want to say thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Jerry Sullivan. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Ryan. Sorry, Mr. Ryan, I couldn't read your first name. John. John Ryan, thank you. I was at the, uh, uh, thank you my, my, uh, let me speak. I was at the uh, April 18th budget meeting the budget workshop, and Fred Newberry, at the end of it, mentioned the need for a spending plan over three years, calendar 18, 19, and 20. And I suggest that as part of the next June budget meeting, such a plan be introduced as part of that budget meeting to show what, what activity is going to be going on in the town 18, 19, and 20. Because my sense of everything is that there's going to need to be a, a property tax increase to pay for the fire station and the like and other things that may be on the agenda. And there's an election coming up in November for the mayor and for a council member. And I think it would be important to have that document 
in circulation, discussed as part and be vetted as part of the selection of a mayor and another council member. And for, I looked at some of the numbers already on the, uh, the acquisition and the building of the, um, of the uh, new fire station. And I used some of the numbers that were available from the presentation that was made by the, the, the fire service. And I'm not sure how, the, how you account for it in, in the books. I'm not familiar with government accounting. I'm familiar with regular accounting commercial accounting, but if you borrow $5.4 million over a 10-year period, the interest on that was $1.1 million. So that's $6.2 million that you amortize over 10 years. So that's $620,000 a year, which I assume would run through the budget. Now, we don't have that coverage <coughs> in the budget. And the only way we, we pay for that is through the um, property tax, the Southern Shores property tax. So the property tax that we collect right now is 2.8 million, thereabouts. So $620,000 represents 20, uh, approximately 25% increase over the current, call it the current property tax for each individual in the town. And I think people should know that prior to an election for a new mayor and a new council member. And I may run over for a few seconds, but in the meeting, the mayor, you mentioned at this meeting, you mentioned a number of items that we need to discuss and you were looking for funding for. Obviously the fire station, South Dogwood, North Dogwood, and uh, Councilman McDonald's always pushing, pushing for the repairs and you mentioned a bulkhead repair and also possible uh, redredging of the, of the canals. So I'm looking at like an $8 million tab over the next several years. Th thank you. All right? Yes, sir. Got it. Well, actually, you owe me time. You guys owe me time because at that April 18th meeting, I had to sit through a half-hour discussion of the aluminum, the purchase and classification of the aluminum pontoon boats that you want to buy for cleaning up the uh, canals f for sticks and... Thank you, sir, very much, sir. Appreciate your time tonight. All right. Be well. Appreciate your comments. This time I'll close public comment, uh, and I'll turn the meeting over to our town attorney for a public hearing <coughs> on the preliminary assessment resolution for Beach Nourishment Project, for our Beach Nourishment Project. Thank you, yes. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At your, at your last hearing, you adopted a, um, a preliminary resolution uh, regarding your intent to move forward with the Beach Nourishment Project and to uh, provide for a special assessment of certain properties. And you set a public hearing today to be uh, for interested persons to come and appear and speak to you on that before you adopt or consider the adoption of a uh, resolution directing Beach Nourishment Project be undertaken and that those special assessments be assessed. So I will open the public hearing. Um, if you'll raise your hand if you would like to speak, I'll try and find you and I'll ask you to come up to the podium if you could state your name, state your address, um, and uh, state your comments about the uh, special assessment. Uh, anyone wish to speak? Mr. Mayor, uh, seeing no one wishing to speak to the first public hearing, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, the next thing before you is a consideration of a resolution directing that a beach nourishment project be undertaken and specially assessed. If you find that appropriate, then someone would make a motion to adopt that. Council, do I have a motion to adopt the, um, the resolution <coughs> described um, in, our, in our agenda, directing that a beach nourishment project be undertaken and especially assessed? I need a motion to, um, so to approve that. Thank you, Chris. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion has been made and carried. Uh, 
that we undertake our beach, beach nourishment project and the assessment to go with it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And now we have a second public hearing um, to uh, consider the uh, preliminary assessment role, which is the distribution of costs of that assessment across the different properties. Um, at your last uh, meeting that you adopted the preliminary role um, based on the estimated cost of the project of $150,000 going uh, being distributed across the assessed properties. Um, and one thing to mention from the last uh, resolution, you would also, uh, in the meantime, uh, Sheila has sent uh, all the interested parties the necessary notice and published the notice is in the meeting um, of this hearing in the newspaper um, for both this hearing and the prior hearing. Um, and she certified that to you in writing as well. But there, this public hearing, is there anyone who wishes to speak to this one? Seeing no one, Mr. Mayor, I will uh, close this public hearing. And your next item is consideration of the adoption of the actual assessment role. Resolution confirming the assessment role and levying assessments for the Beach Nourishment Project. Council, I need a motion to, uh, to approve the resolution confirming assessment, the assessment role and levying assessment for a beach nourishment project. Do I have a motion for that, to that effect? Uh, did uh, all the residents agree or not agree, or how, how, did, that, how did that percentage go? I, I think that breakdown is in your. Is in your uh, yeah, I see. I, 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 <laughs> my uh, recollection from the prior, that was part of the prior resolutions that oh, okay. were considered at the last meeting, but my recollection was that it was uh, 36 out of 38 signatures that were necessary oh, okay. and that, uh, the, that that was a 50 percent requirement, I believe, and then there was a 66 percent of value requirement, and I think it was uh, 14 or 16 million compared to 18 million, so it was well over the 66 percent requirement for the land value that was associated with it. No, so okay. the, the reality, the majority, the, the very vast majority, majority of people okay. signed the petition asking for the assessments. And then the, uh, the other uh, issue that's outstanding is the easements for the um, nourishment project. And I believe that there's only one outstanding easement and uh, we think it's pretty likely that that one will get resolved. The resolution doesn't seem to be a disagreement as much as an, an understanding of who needs to sign. Um, and on the part of the people who are signing. Oh, okay. Apparently, just to follow up on what uh, Mr. Gallup just said, the, the, some of this has been a question of being able to contact the appropriate parties. They don't live here, they aren't yeah. able to track, easy to track down, but as far as we know, that 99% are on board with this project. So I, I need to reiterate my motion to uh, Confirm the assessment role, uh, assessment role and living assessment for Beach Nourishment Project. All in favor of that? I'll second. You second, I got it. Yeah. Aye. Any further discussion? No, I answered my questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion's made and carried. At this time, we have to consider budget amendment number 17, Council, in your, in your uh, packet. For funding a special assessment portion of the Beach Nourishment Project prior to assessment collection. Um, are there any questions about that before we go further with it? As the money is collected over that five period, then that will go back into the undesignated fund balance? Yes, sir. That's the way we'll set that up. It should come in. There's some, some owners have indicated they want to pay all of it at one time, but even as it comes in incrementally, um, the way it will be booked is pay, a payback to the undesignated, unassigned fund balance. And, and so, that's going to be collected or assigned as part of the annual tax bill from the county? We're, we're going to um, meet with the tax office tomorrow morning and transmit these resolutions that you just passed to them. <coughs> and it would be it will be included on the Hadron tax bill that goes out in, Ju in, in July. will be printed in July and goes out toward the end of the summer. So that's the, um, and then they will track the payments, of course, and, and remit the payments to us as they come through the tax office during each year. And they'll probably be scattered around because some of uh, don't get paid to November or December. Th that's correct. I mean, they, they could pay at any time they yeah. wanted to. Oh, okay. 
it, it is the important thing. It, it is a lean process, as we explained to the owners. So it, it, they, some of them may paint it sooner, and some of them may paint it, pay it annually like they're going to be um, billed for. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peter, a uh, follow-up question. Yes. We had, a, we had a long discussion in our budget meeting. So to be clear that that 150000 the town, it'll be in this coming year's budget as um, as an expense, but that's going to come back to us over the period of, of five years or less. That's so, correct. And and I did want to follow up on that, um, Councilman Nason. We're doing this now in fiscal year 16-17. Um, we set it up this way because we have, if you take action on the next item on the agenda, that starts the contractual um, relationship with the county to get the dredger moving. Um, that's anticipating uh, possibly that we may have to spend the money in this fiscal year. If we don't spend the money in this fiscal year, then we'll have to let that revert back into fund balance and redo this in July to be able to pay for it in next fiscal year. Just so I want to get that on the record so you're clear on that. We may not spend it this, this okay. fiscal year, so we have to come back and do it again. So it's a timing thing. It's just yeah, we're, it, we're, in, we're almost in between a little bit here. Yes. We had no idea when they were going to start when we started the process. So if it, they start in June and do it in June, we got to write a check. If they don't, we'll have to roll this over and it'll automatically go back into unassigned fund balance. And then we'll have to do it again in July. Are, are we still on target to start in June uh, or do we know yet? Or is that a moving target? It sounds a moving like. target. Um, I haven't heard anything this week. Uh, we're still, the Kitty Hawk portion would start either, um, supposedly it's supposed to start end of June. Whether Southern Shores is at the beginning of that or at the end of that is the question. We don't know yet. Oh, okay. Never made that decision. So it could be toward the end, toward the middle of the 1st of August, or it could be 1st of, 1st of July. Okay. Yeah. All, this is, all this is predicated on the, on our permit. Honestly. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if, we don't we, get if for some reason that fell out, we'd come back and we'd just negate everything if that fell out totally. Any other questions, Council? No, I don't have any. Do you need a motion here? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm looking to see what I've got to ask you to do. <coughs> to approve uh, budget member number 17 for funding the special assessment portion of the Beach Norman Project prior to assessment collection. Do I have a motion to do that, Council? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion is made and carried. Thank you. <coughs> Consideration of the interlocal agreement between Dare County and the Town of Southern Shores for Beach Nourishment for the Deep Beach Nourishment Project. This is this is part of the package where the town the county uh, came we went to them and then they returned to us and said they would help us with this project and would fund fifty percent of the cost of the project not to exceed five hundred thousand dollars. And that's that's what we have to do now is go back to them and say, yeah, we're gonna, we want to move forward with this in good faith and, and we need a, a resolution or, or a approval of the, of, the, of the agreement between Dare County and the Town of Southern Shores in order for them to, to accept this and move forward with it. Any questions about that? And th is this because they're the contractor or the fact that they're providing the, going to assist yes. us with 500,000 or thereabouts? The, yes, yeah, sir. The, the underlying reason is, of course, Dare County is the actual party that's in con under contract with Great Lakes Dredging to do the actual construction. Each of the other towns that are benefiting from a portion of, of the project enter into an interlocal agreement with Dare County to stand in that place for the period of the contract. And so we're being asked to do the same thing that Kitty Hawk killed over the Ilts and Town of Duck did. Okay. We're doing exactly the same thing, um, and because of the scope of our project, for much less money than what they're doing it for. But it's the same, exact same principle. So I need a motion to, uh, to go ahead and approve the interlocal agreement between Dare County and Town of Southern Shores for Beach Nourishment. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is made and carried. Uh, Peter and, and Sheila to do that. Thank you. Any new business, Council? I don't have any. Uh, no public comment. Anyone sign up for public comment, Sheila?
Tommy Carroll. I need to say, I'd also like to hear Chris and Leo's position on the low impact development curve of gutters and how it pertains to the uh, uh, adopted plan of our town, the adopted land use plan. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Having other business, unless someone has other business they want to discuss, I'd like to move ahead and take my little time for my mayor's comments. And I'll get uh, Mr. Carroll's question out of the way early on because I think it's important that we address that. Um, we had no intention of not complying with the town's land use plan or long range plans uh, in, in what we did with the um, the street rebuild uh, uh, procedure and policies we set up about two years ago and uh, two and a half years ago, almost three years ago now, and that was debated uh, among the, the committee and the council as to how we address our street improvements, knowing they needed to be done. And all those criteria had been spelled out and available for the public, rev public review and public discussion from, from that time forth. And to address specifically the curb and gutter issue, um, we've used true curb and gutter in a few spots like at Sea Oats and, uh, and Hillcrest where we couldn't control the water storm up without it. The curb and gutter you're seeing now going in is a, is a drive over type curb and it's used primarily to protect the, the shoulders of the intersection. We found when we didn't do that, like at Hickory Trail, we had not only, not only shoulder uh, and edge failure, we had people driving over off the road to, to avoid having to wait at the intersection and make their turn. So to protect those, that investment in the road itself, we, we, uh, we put these low drive over type curbs. It's not a true curb and gutter, it's strictly a drive over curb to protect the corners of those roads, the intersections. Uh, that's the only thing I've seen put in recently of those types and we're doing the same thing we're at, at Osprey and, and Wild Swan and it works. It, it saves our, shoulder, our road edge and our shoulders and that's why it's being done. <coughs> And I'm not going to argue whether, it's, whether it's, it's perceived as low impact or whether it's not perceived as low impact. It does, it does work as far as saving that street and that intersection. <clears throat> I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Debbie. Um, thank you, Debbie. You've said that before, and I appreciate that. Well, it's very upsetting. I understand that. Sorry, I let, a, little, a, little, a little higher note, guys, something a little more important, I think, to talk about, or just equally important. Uh, I attended a, um, for informational purposes, I attended a meeting uh, this past Wednesday with our town planner, uh, Albemarle Regional Rural Planning Organization meeting in Eden, North Carolina. Um, the Albemarle Rural Planning Organization is our representative voice with NCDOT through Division One of our, of our, of our Division of Door and Transportation. Uh, we found out there that, that the mid curry Tuck Bridge start has been delayed until at least 2018, possibly a little beyond. Apparently, once again, because of the a ACLU, as you no, all know, that no, goes no, on and on. The, no, Southern, Southern Law. Southern Environmental Law Service yeah. Center, yes. Uh, the, uh, Another thing that was kind of a bright spot, as you, the ARPO also is involved with our ferry service. They, they, they support that and work with that. And the uh, passenger ferry service to Ocracoke, which has been talked about now for about two and a half years, um, should start in spring or early summer of, of uh, 2018. So next year we'll have passenger service, ferry service. Ocracoke means you haven't got to take your car. You can just go over there and Ocracoke is, uh, in the process of planning and, and implementing a tram service on Ocracoke Island so you'll be able to get around the island without having your car. Uh, one, little, one little statistic, uh, North Carolina is the, nice, is the ninth most populous state in the nation, but we uh, have the fifth highest number of highway fatalities on our roads, which I thought was interesting. Um, on the weekend, I was fortunate to be able to go to the Special Olympics in Kill, Kill Devil Hills some of you may have been there. We were represented as a town uh, in big numbers. Lots of the coaches and lots of the participants also are residents of our town. 
Uh, the churches get involved pretty heavily in this, and Knights of Columbus gets involved very heavily in this. This year, there was a, let me step back a, a notch. Last year, there were a number of bikers who were here for Bike Week, of course, who heard about this and came and participated. They, they actually started the, they started the event by going around the track a couple, three or four times and boom, 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 type, in the, and the participants really, really loved that because it kind of brought a spark of excitement to the whole process. This year we had 65 bikers who participated in this and uh, from different bike clubs in the area and they really, really got into it. They were having a great time. Uh, those bikers, those bike clubs, uh, I think the number, the dollars was somewhere in the, under $3,000 $3, was contributed to the Special Olympics by them, which I thought was a tremendous uh, gesture of, of goodwill on their part. Anyway, um, The, 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 the Olympics are, are pretty special because these are people that are very challenged, not just, not just kids, but adults and children, and they get out there and give it their best, and there's no winners and losers. When they, when they run or when they cross the finish line, they hug each other. They, they're not looking over the shoulder saying, yeah, 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 beat you, like you'd see so often, but it was just a very rewarding experience to see that. And as, as I say, we were very represented, I was mean, very proud of our town for the people we have here helping with that and making it possible. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Holland, anything you want to add? Well, I'll address the LID up front. Uh, I think we, you know, we meet every, whenever we do these projects, or street projects, early on, there are meetings periodically with, the, you know, drawing that with the residents, and I think that's where some of this should be discussed and why it's done this way or maybe not that way. Uh, rather than just applying something across the board for every street. Because like in my street, lower in the spin drift, we do have a curb and gutter there, and that was needed because I had the water in my yard and some others did too, and it moved it away from it. So I think we have to look at each one individually. So that's my position on it. Uh, the other thing, speaking of your Special Olympics, uh, uh, the Knights of Columbus are the ones that support that very heavily, not only uh, manpower, resources, financially as well. And uh, I was unable to attend because my son's seriously ill. Uh, so the group, they provide the color guard, the opening ceremony, and uh, a lot of things. In the, and it's really interesting to be there to interact with those people that are challenged and, uh, you know, the things we take for granted they have a tough time with. Now, this Friday, uh, they will have, be having their bowling tournament uh, down at the bowling alley. So if any of you want to go attend or observe, uh, that's, that's another fun event for them as well. So, uh, and, they, and the thing you'll learn, they become, uh, they're very dependent on their caregivers. And so uh, I know last year I helped at the bowling and I was trying to help one of the people down and because the caregiver had a broken arm and because the person didn't know me, there was a little bit of a apprehension of me trying to help them. So um, that, that that's goes in it. Uh, one of our last uh, meetings, we talked about House Bill 531, which was uh, how distribution of funds to the Tourism Bureau was going to be uh, handled. Uh, that did not get out of uh, committee. So. Uh, we're operating, the tourism board's operating as it has been without any, any restrictions because there was really some concern if that bill had uh, been passed, how are we going to handle grants that had already been promised and how future ones would be handled. And I just want to share with you, Southern Shores over time has shared in some of these grants. Uh, back in 94, 95, there was a multi-use bike path uh, there was a $20,000 grant there that was awarded. And then in 1999-2000 was a multi-use path along NC-12. That was a $100,000 grant that was given. And, uh, then the uh, Spindrift multi-use path, which I do use a lot. I walk on it when I'm home every morning. Uh, that was a $50,000 grant. And then the um, 
uh, South Dogwood Trail multi-use path, uh, that was a $50,000 grant. So over time, uh, the, tourism, the town has used some of the tourism dollars to for safety, because you know, the paths do help on from a safety factor. And that's all I got. Thank you, Leo. Chris, anything? Um, yeah, just really quickly, uh, keep it brief. I wanted to address Tommy's question. Um, and also to speak to, thank Carlos for coming. Carlos um, and I spoke a good deal over the past month or so on this particular issue. I think he brings uh, a level-headedness to it um, that I would that I appreciate. Um, and and from, my, from my perspective is, um, I, I guess I'd say look at all the tools in the tool bag. We've got, to, per Leo's point, I think we need to look at what best fits the situation. But I would also not go so far as, as Ms. Newberry and say that it's, it, that it's only one solution, um, that it has to be a certain thing. I think that low, low intensity development is, is, as much as we can would be great, but there may be situations where it doesn't work, where you need a more um, substantive engineering solution like a dogwood. Um, and so I, I guess I'd say let's embrace the nuance and, and let's try to find the best solution for each, each place and keep talking about it. Um, and, and I, I guess, like I said, like, like I said before, I appreciate Carlos speaking to this because he does have a lot of knowledge here. Um, and, and maybe this is a, a point where we ask um, the town engineer to come back and, and talk to us about uh, low impact design. Uh, and and I, if we did that, I would encourage the public to be respect, <coughs> respectful and, and not attack him, but, but I think that's an important thing to describe what is, what are we talking about? Because it seems like we're, we're fighting over definitions and may, maybe each of us have different definitions for what we're doing. So, so I think that would really help to, to hear his definition for this. And, and then we can begin <coughs> to have that dialogue. So that's it. Thank you, Chris. Any further business counsel? Nope. Did I ask a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Meeting's adjourned, thank you.